Welcome to Walk It Out with Trisha Goyer, where I share inspiring stories of ordinary people who walk out God's Word and discover radical results along the way. Friends, have you ever found yourself in a difficult situation? Maybe it was a time you were facing health challenges or challenges with your kids or finances, all the challenges of life, and then you found yourself experiencing anger in ways that you hadn't before. I know when we adopted kids, it's a lot of big challenges, but more than ever, their anger really triggered mine. You know, I didn't really think of myself as an angry person. Sure, there was times I grew angry. There was times uh, our biological kids grew angry and we had to deal with that anger. But I know after we had brought the kids home, both the younger set of kids that were ages two and five when we adopted them and the teen girls, especially who ages 11 and 14, I really found myself struggling with anger. I had to learn how to control myself in order to control or help calm my kids. And I think sometimes it catches us by surprise. We don't um, feel comfortable with the way we're acting, but we don't know how to stop. We don't know how to control ourselves. Today, my guest will be talking about anger and about some challenging situations that she found herself in um, that brought out anger that she hadn't expected. And my guest that you'll be hearing from in just a little bit is Amber Leah. And I met Amber actually through her protection production company first. And it's super exciting that we're working on a project together that we'll be able to announce hopefully soon. It's going to be super exciting. But Amber is also the author of a book called Triggers. And it's all about how moms, how parents can handle their anger, control their anger, and instead respond with biblical and gentle responses. And you may be thinking, okay, there's no way. I just am having such a hard time. I can't imagine biblical or calm or gentle responses with my kids. Well, I want to, want to let you know, friends, that there is hope. There is hope because God is there to be the one to give us hope, to be able to help us in our hard times, help us from the inside out. And I know that you'll be encouraged. Now, before I bring on Amber, I want to say that this is the last um, episode, podcast episode in the Calming Angry Kids series. And I loved all my guests so far. I loved what they shared. And I know I learned something Every time I talk to someone about what God has taught them about anger, whether it's with themselves or with their kids. But if you want more, um, I know you've listened to this podcast, but if you want more, be sure to check out my book, which is Calming Angry Kids, um, Hope and Help for Parents in, in the Whirlwind. And it's available wherever books are sold, whether it's your local bookstore, Barnes and Noble, Amazon.com, ChristianBook.com, Lifeway, all these places you can find a copy of Calming Angry Kids. And I love getting feedback. I've gotten so much feedback from parents already that are that are encouraged. And the one thing that I hear over and over again is that I give tips that are doable. And I think so many times when we read books, whether it's on anger or finances or just marriage advice, all these things. There's a lot of concepts, but very few action steps. And calming angry kids, I really wanted to include action steps. I include things that I learned going to therapy with my kids, great tools that were taught to me that I pass them on to you. So if you are struggling with anger, you have a child who's struggling with anger, or it doesn't even have to be huge anger. It can just be everyday stuff that kids deal with in different ages and stages. I know this book will be 
an encouragement to you also, if you know a family that is adopting or fostering, I guarantee this will be the best gift that you can give them. Um, because all the things that I learned, I learned after we already had kids in the home and we're already in the middle of all the conflict. Um, and I just had to, we had to work through it and I'm still applying these things on a daily basis that I learned going to therapy, reading books, um, trying things out, learning to calm my kids. So be sure to check out Calming Angry Kids. And right now, I know you'll enjoy this conversation with Amber. Well, welcome to Walk It Out. Amber, I am so glad that you're here. Well, I am equally glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Trisha. Yeah, it's super fun. We just got to spend the weekend together at a conference and it's always great to be able to connect face to face. And then now, bonus, we get to connect on this interview. I know. I'm I feel like I'm finally having as much of Trisha as I always want to have. <laughs> getting to see you <laughs> and getting to talk to you. It's like, oh, wish we were neighbors, but this will do. That uh, for now. We'll we'll work on the neighbor part later. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Amber, I know you've um, written some awesome books, triggers and parenting scripts, and that you just have a, a wonderful online ministry that just talks about, um, you know, controlling anger and then responding with gentle responses. But I would just love to hear how it all got started. Well, it's really, I think a lot of things in life that we find ourselves doing, um, especially if they're things that our ministries in some way or another are things that we probably would never have chosen to be involved in or talk about or write about. And that has been very true for me. I was a literature teacher for years and I would have loved to have written like the next great American novel. Like that was my dream. And then life actually happened and I had um, three little boys, four and under, and uh, moved to another part of my state where I didn't know a lot of people and I didn't have a support system. And I began to struggle just with frustrations of mothering and parenting and my own feelings of anger. And I was really kind of caught off guard by all of that. And I, I really went through a journey myself uh, over the course of several years um, toward a more gentle and biblical approach to parenting my kids. But as part of that process, I also started ministering to women online in a private Facebook group. And I still have a private Facebook group now. It's called Gentle Parenting with Amber and Wendy. And just on a daily basis, I was in there just sharing from my own personal experiences and how to cope with these feelings of frustration and anger. And eventually, as a result, I felt God really pressing on my spirit that I needed to compile a lot of things that I had learned myself and also just in working with thousands of, of moms and dads on a, on a regular basis and put that into um, the first book that my, my good friend Wendy Speak co-authored with me. And she's really active in the Facebook group with me as well. We're, we're partners in all of that. And God has just blessed it because it really is a struggle that I came to realize eventually a lot of people deal with. I thought I was the only one. And that was a very um, shaming feeling to have that why was everybody else looking like they had their acts together and I clearly did not. And so these books, this ministry that I have was not one that I would have chosen, but it's definitely one that I feel has been filled with purpose and hope and transformation in my own life and then getting to share that with others. Yeah, and I think so many times, like, I know when I first started wanting to write a book, I wanted to, like, write about what I was good at, <laughs> or, like, yeah. these sweet little romances, or these simple little things, and, like, my first nonfiction book was about teen parenting and being a teen mom, and it really shared, like, a lot of the mistakes and the heartache, and I think so many times, like, we want to be, look at us, we are doing so great, <laughs> and really, people can't connect with that. They can connect, and we're like, I have messed up. These are the mistakes I made. This is how God's helping me. And it really makes a difference because people understand. So I know when you first started ministering to women, I mean, it, there was just so many people that poured in wanting help. Did that surprise you at all? 
I was totally caught off guard by that. I opened the group up. I was writing for um, a, a few different contributing websites where I write articles for other blogs and websites that have a collection of writers. And um, the owners of that website had, you know, suggested that people maybe would benefit from a private group like this. And I wasn't sure that I really wanted to do that because I had already been through those stages of working through it. I didn't really want to revisit it or open up that can of worms again, but I felt like the Lord was asking me to do so. So when I started that group, it completely took me off guard because we had over a thousand people join the first week alone. Oh my goodness. And it grew to nearly 20,000 people over the course of just like two years. And we didn't advertise it a whole lot. It was mostly word of mouth. And so that was a big aha moment for me and a clear message from the Lord really that, okay, this is an area of need. This is where um, I'm alive and well and working. And so keep, um, you know, reaching out and helping people. And it, it's really been a healing process for me because none of us have ever arrived, right, Trisha? Just because you've written over 70 books doesn't mean you've figured out everything. It means that we're journeying no. <laughs> along oftentimes with our readers. And so that's true for me. It's continued to allow me to grow even more and to realize I'm still not alone. There's still a lot of people like me out there and like you, and we're better together. We're better together if we can go through uh, this growth process and encourage each other. That's so important, that fellowship and communication with each other. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, when we are alone, we feel like we're the only one that struggles and I'm the worst mom. And it's so easy like to look at Instagram and Facebook and all these happy pictures. But that's what I love about online communities or even, you know, especially face-to-face -face communities when you could be with other people and they could say, me too, I struggle with the same things and then find tips and things that can help them. So tell us like right away, um, what were some of the tips that you were offering to people? Well, for me, you know, th there's so many verses that speak to this issue of anger. And it's sort of hard to know, well, what does that really look like in my everyday life as a mom or as a dad? And so like, just for example, one verse, um, Psalm 103, 8 says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And I had experienced that kind of love from the Lord in my own walk with him. Like there were lots of times when I messed up and I didn't feel like God just coming down on me like a ton of bricks or um, addressing every single thing I did all the time. He didn't punish me, um, you know, in ways that were crushing to me. He really, you know, the Bible also talks about how God draws us with his loving kindness and that it's his loving kindness that draws us to repentance. And in my own mind, and I think a lot of parents get into this trap, we think if we don't nip everything in the bud and put them in timeouts or spank them continually or whatever, they're going to grow up to be these wayward kids. And, you know, this is our job is to just address every issue. And so for me, when I started recognizing in my own parenting that I was quick to anger, that I was easily frustrated, that I was trying to manage everything they did, if it wasn't the right thing, I was trying to be on top of it. It was, I was exhausted. My kids were exhausted. All of us were miserable. And so I started looking at verses just about, you know, ones that necessarily we don't apply to our parenting, but like, it, you know, it says that it, it's a good thing to overlook offenses, you know, sometimes that, that, that we can offer mercy and grace that when someone offers you a curse, what do you do? You offer a blessing. So I had to sort of reframe my approach with my kids. And I suggest this in, in many different practical ways throughout triggers. But one of the things I did was I just started praying for discernment. Lord, when does my child really need some discipline? When is this a situation where they're immature and I need to maybe offer them some coaching and some modeling and practicing, not just going straight to punishment, but working on whatever the situation is. Maybe they tend to um, talk back to me a lot. That's a problem. And so I need to say, hey, you know, this is not honoring God or honoring me. And so 
let's come up with a plan so that we can start communicating in a way that is good and right instead of you talking back to me. And so here's what that looks like. Let me show you. Like, remember the other day when you were, we were at the ice cream shop and I said no to the waffle cone and you kept talking back to me and protesting, even though I was clear, how could that have looked different? You know, and then kind of talking through what would be acceptable and what's not. And hey, let's practice this together. And so, you know, looking for those opportunities, but applying God's word of, of being loving and kind, of not always punishing all the time, sometimes overlooking things, sometimes offering mercy, sometimes being more gracious just in my own thinking. And so it was just a real shift in my attitude, trying to reflect more of how I felt like God treats me as a parent of me, his daughter, and then applying that in my parenting with my kids. Yeah, I love that so much. And it's so interesting because when we first started going to therapy, you know, I was used to parenting the way that I'd always parented. And we had a, added a two and a half year old and a, a five year old and I'm like, don't do that. Stop doing that. You know, we need to have a time out because you're not listening to me. And the things that they had me do was completely opposite. They had me um, sit down and bond with them and play with them one on one, praise them, you know, repeat what they're saying, comment on what they're doing. And then also, um, instead of just, you know, going over and over on the things they were doing wrong, um, the smallest thing that they were doing right, just praise as big as I could. And so kind of ignoring ignoring the negative and pretty soon like you know they're talking about like even if they're picking up toys or you tell them to pick up toys if they're not if they just happen to throw a toy in the direction of the toy box it's sort of like praising like crazy great job you know you know you almost got it in and all of a sudden they're like oh I kind of like this and so all these activities they had us doing wasn't like how to discipline which you know I had taken lots of parenting classes before on how to discipline. And really it was, we need to bond with these kids so that they'll want to listen to us. So they want to connect with us. Um, And that made a huge difference in my life and in my parenting. So when you start talking about gentle parenting, what is the type of response that you get from parents? Well, I try to also suggest that instead of reacting, we're responding, right? So a reaction to me says that, you know, sometimes we take it personal. And now our feelings as a parent are hurt or we're embarrassed because we think that everybody's going to see what's going on at the restaurant when our child is, you know, throwing food or whatever they're doing that's totally inappropriate. And now we're embarrassed. So I'm going to react and and probably not in a good way. Um, So all of the, the main thing that I tried to retrain in my thinking was to respond instead of react. And to respond feels more um, life-giving toward my child. it, It says to me, this is something I'm trying to do to help my child, as opposed to reacting, which is more about me and my high emotions, my feelings, and then that usually causes an engagement with them that's less than, um, honorable or gentle or biblical. And so when I want to respond to my children, it, it does need to be more gentle. Now, I want to make sure that people aren't getting the message that this is permissive parenting where we never address the things that they're doing that are not right or that are sinful. And so the, the idea that I talk a lot about in Triggers is this idea of coaching them. Because when you have a coach, that person, they evaluate where you're at you know, where your weaknesses are, or we could even say where your sin issues are. And then they, they make a plan and they, you come to practice and it's called practice because nobody arrives, you know, and is a star athlete or a star musician or a perfect Christian, you know, early on in their immaturity and their walks with the Lord. And so our goal for me as a parent is to really coach my kids for the behavior I want in them. And that takes a lot of intentionality, actually. It's not permissive at all. So when those those moments come along that are triggers that could make me really angry and frustrated, and you talk about this, Tricia, with kids too, is that those are the opportunities that we have to come alongside them, you know, as a coach and say, okay, this isn't working or this is wrong. So 
uh, we're going to put a plan in place now. And we do talk very specifically about what some of those plans are in the books, but just in general, shifting our thinking to I'm a coach. So I'm not just letting them get away with stuff, but I am going to um, approach it gently and lovingly as a conversation, as a way for us to connect, like you were saying, you know, really listening to them, getting to the root of the issue, trying to reach their heart and have some understanding, and then putting some specific things in place and eventually even some consequences where, you know, if, if my response is to punish them right in the moment, everybody's emotional, they go to their room or they lose a privilege, and then we never discuss it again. Like there's really no behavior change in them. There's no heart that's being reached and it doesn't feel gentle or biblical. But when I look at the problem as, okay, they there's some more work to be done with my child. They're still talking back to me or my child has trouble with lying to me or there's all these problems between these two siblings. So instead of just always parenting in the aftermath of conflict and that causing me to be angry and upset, I can think of it more as a coaching situation and then put some plans in place to really work on, I try to just do one area of need at a time so that we don't get overwhelmed and they don't get overwhelmed. And and like you said, using lots more um, reframing of our, our thinking process to catch them doing things that are good, you know, to affirm them and to breathe life into them as often as we can. And that to me is just a, a much more gentle approach to parenting than the things that they do wrong and then punishing them or there being lots of conflict and then forgetting to go back and really work through those problems until the next problem comes along and everybody's angry and frustrated. Yeah. And it's just like the cycle that continues. And I love how you use the term coaching because I think so many times in all other parts of parenting, we know we have to coach our kids. Like we coach them to use the toilet. We coach them to put their, clear the, their table after we get done eating. And we're, we're always coaching, but we often don't think of emotions, of reactions, of all these things on things we need to coach them for. It's just don't do that. And we never say this is what you do instead. So, you know, just telling our kids like, this is how you calm yourself down, or this is how you should react. And this really was apparent to me um, when we had our five-year-old who I call Sissy in the book. And when she got hurt, she would get mad. So she'd skin her knee and she would get super mad and just hit the wall. And, you know, or she would be sad and she would react in angry ways. And I talked to the therapist and they said, you never know what happened before when she got hurt. Maybe people laughed at her. Maybe she got a spanking because she was bothering someone. Maybe she was ignored. She was never taught how to be comforted, how to like, oh, come to mommy. And we actually had a teacher like, okay, come to mommy. I'm going to put a bandaid on it. See, I'm good. We're going to wipe it off. We're going to put a bandaid. I'm going to give you a hug. And I had to train her how to react to that emotion. And it was so funny because once, um, She was out riding her bike and she fell off and skinned her knee and her daddy was with her and he's like, come here. And she runs right past him because we had just trained her to come to mommy. Like we hadn't (laughs) trained her. You can go to daddy too. Um, But I never thought about that, that until it was so clear, but emotions and how to respond and how to react are ways that we are, that we teach our kids. And for me growing up, um, our house was very much you hold it in you hold it in you hold it in and then then you explode (laughs) so you the same thing might happen for a week and no one says anything then all of a sudden someone's yelling at you and exploding in anger um and so you know for most of my parenting I'd hold it in hold it in and then explode and my kids would be like what in the world is going on and it's what we learned but it's so important to teach how to respond to emotions and I think what you said teachers should just just um that that process of really listening to our kids and that those emotions are not something we just want to breeze past or try to remove them so we don't have to deal with them as parents. But one practical thing I often say, I have one, one of my kids gets very emotional very quickly and it makes it just everything heightened. The conflict gets heightened, whatever it is. And so I've practiced learning to say to him, son, just breathe, slow down. I'm listening breathe, slow down. I'm listening. And his body just relaxes because he knows that I'm not going to dismiss him. 
I'm not going to shut him down, um, that he's going to be heard. And sometimes kids just need that sense of control too, you know, to be like, okay, I feel out of control and that's why these emotions are so big, or that's why, um, I'm talking really, really, really fast, you know, and can't, nobody else can get a word in edgewise. And so to even just say to our kids to, to listen to them more is a really gentle parenting practice and to take the time to look in their eyes and show empathy. You know, empathy as a tool as part of gentle parenting is also really important and, and calming angry kids and calming ourselves when we get angry is to look at them and say, you know, my child isn't trying to make my day difficult right now. They're really, they're really sad or they're really hurting and it doesn't make sense to me, you know, why they would behave this way when all they did was skin their knee. But to them, it may have layers of meaning or history behind it um, and emotion. And so when we can even just show them empathy um, and understanding, or even if it's not something as natural as skinning a knee, but even when there's sibling rivalry, like sometimes they need, they just need to know that we hear them and we see them and we're going to help them work through things. Again, that's sort of a coaching idea as opposed to I'm the authority. This is what's going to happen. You just do what I say. Yeah. And I love that word empathy. And often I'll say, I know what your sibling did and that would make me mad too. And I will go talk to them but let's talk about your response right now. You know, So let them know like that, that would make me mad too if someone did that to me and I will take care of that. And just that first part, like that would make me mad too. It's like they could say, okay, like my parent, my mom gets it and, and she understands. And I love also empathy. I think so many times it doesn't even have to be in the moment of conflict or, you know, if we just know one of our kids is going through tough stuff, I have a, a teen daughter who's been going through real tough stuff. And so last night in my room, I just like lowered the lights and I'm like, I told her to come here. And the first thing that my kids always ask is, I was, am I in trouble? Which that's a problem when they think I'm only going to talk to them when they're in trouble. But I'm like, hey, I just want to see how things are going. And we just climbed up. We both like sat under the comforter and the lights are low. So she's not feeling like I'm just staring on her and pressure. And we're just like cuddled up. And I'm like, so what's going on? And she was able just to lay there for like 20 minutes and tell me what's going on. And, you know, later she came back and it's like, mom, thank you for that. And it's just, you know, we don't have to wait till like there's conflict um, to, to have that time with our kids to say, hey, what's really going on? Is there anything that's, that you're struggling with right now? And I forget to do that. <laughs> Sometimes it does take the big conflict to be like, oh, okay, I really need to connect with this kid. But we can do that anytime with any kid. And they really want that. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I think that's so important, Tricia. That is, I mean, imagine having a parent who does that, who, who's so just kind of in tune and aware that, that just in the course of a day, they'll just come alongside you and breathe life into you and show you compassion and a listening ear. I mean, that's what we get to do with God. We get to go to him at any time of day and, and we sense his presence with us all throughout the day when, when we're drawing near to him because he, he longs to be with us and spend time with us and to encourage us. And so I want to mimic that and model that toward my children. And I found that when there's something like that, that I want to do, but I just forget because one day leads to the next and the next. And it's like, Oh, I, you know, I'm not taking advantage of those moments. I will literally put a little reminder into my phone, into my smartphone, or write a sticky note on my um, morning bedside table or something of that nature that is just a reminder to me, you know, look for opportunities to connect with so-and-so today. You know, look for an opportunity to um, connect emotionally, you know, whatever it may be. And so Take advantage of modern day technology to remind us, because sometimes we feel like, well, if, if I don't just naturally think to do it or say it, it doesn't count. But that's not true at all. You know, it's we are busy. We do have a lot on our plates and it, it is a challenge at times to stop and be intentional that way. But what a gift if we can do it. So take advantage of whatever you need to help um, remind yourself to take take those moments to heart and really make it happen. Yeah, I mean, it's important for little kids and even big kids. And I am blessed with adult kids now 
And I think because, you know, I do take the time, like, how are you doing today? I try every day, you know, con- to connect with each one of my adult kids, um, just with a text message or something. And then they'll come by later to see me or, you know, my son, um, my other son and husband were out of town and he came over my 29 year old to play a board game with me, you know, but it's those moments when we take time to connect, we build this lasting relationships. And so many people, you know, when the kids turn preteen or teen, they'll naturally pull away and that's okay. Like there does need to be some natural, um, you know, coming into themselves, but we still want to be that touch point. Like, how are you doing today? Anything I could do to help you? What's going on? And they appreciate it so much. And then when there is something happening, they know they can come to us. Um, and I think even when kids are naturally pulling away, just to be that person that will reach out to them, even when sometimes they have a bad attitude and, you know, are are um, pushing away from us. And with tweens and teens and, and older, you know, uh, young adult children, um, I taught um, high school and college level cl- courses for 10 years. And I had a lot of interaction with that age group and I love them dearly. There, it is a challenge as a parent to let them take those steps of independence away from us. But in those years, even just the smallest, like you said, just giving a phone call and saying, you know, how are you doing today or, or what's going on? Or just asking those simple questions without um, being too in- invasive into their privacy, even it goes so much farther than we realize. I remember as a teacher, even I would occasionally I would just notice that something was a little off with a student and we had a little student store on our campus and I would just, you know, buy a 25 cent pencil or something and put a little note on it and uh, deliver it to one of their other classes and say, hey, just noticed you didn't quite seem like yourself today. Um, I just hope that everything's okay and just know that I'm here for you. And I can't tell you how much that meant to those teenage kids. They Um, came to me down the road with very deeply personal struggles that they were going through. And it was an opportunity for me to help them. But that's true in our homes too. We do have to learn to let them have their um, independence and grow in maturity and forge their own pathways. And yet at the same time, never underestimate just even those little touch points and what they mean. Those kids know that we're there for them, like you said, when we need them. And they will come to us when we create that framework of love and love and care and that we see them. They just want to know that they're seen and that we're available at any time. Mm, I love that so much. Well, we only have a few minutes left. And you mentioned sibling rivalry <laughs> a couple of minutes ago. And I think um, out of all the questions, I, I get that a lot for parents. So when you have kids that are in conflict and in anger, and I know sometimes it can be personalities where two kids, you know, if you have a bigger household like we do, just seem to provoke each other. Um, what are your thoughts and tips for that? Well, you know, we have in our house sort of a, a short list of you know, um, just values and, and things that, that we try to foster in our home. And so when sibling rivalry was getting really out of hand with my kids, we just had a, a initially just a, a talk about, you know, our home, in our home, we are peacemakers. And what do you think that means? You know, just a conversation and, and just over the course of a few weeks, I just kind of had this, this theme of being a peacemaker in my mind. And we looked at some verses on what it means to be a peacemaker and what it means to um, to promote peace in our home. But I want to share this one verse because this was kind of um, a foundational verse for me with my boys when it came to sibling rivalry. It's Romans 12, 17 through 20. And we just kind of took this passage a little bit at a time over the period of of even a couple of months and really tried to just focus because sometimes sibling rivalry feels like it's just overwhelming. Like it just never ends. It's constant. And we'll get sucked into chapters of, <laughs> of our lives where sibling rivalry is really rampant. And so sometimes you just need to go back and to the basics and say, okay, everybody, we need to re- remind ourselves that we are peacemakers. And so this verse says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, 
but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Okay, so really this is, there's so many layers of things that we could talk about with our kids, but we just took the time to talk through what that really means. You know, even if it's just before bed for five minutes saying, you know, let's talk about that. What do you think it means when the Bible says, you know, if it depends on you to live at peace with everyone, what would that look like with your brother? Or your sister, can you give me an example? And just start really kind of laying the foundation of talking that through, you know, and just say, you know, when we fight with each other, when we want things that somebody else has and it causes angry words and hurt feelings, we're not really being peacemakers. How could we work this out so that we are promoting peace in those moments? Because our kids are immature, Trisha, you know, they, they don't know instinctively how to work these things out with each other. And instead of us being bothered by sibling rivalry, really frustrated or angry or upset about it, we can look at this as normal and an opportunity for us to point our kids to Christ and to learn how to work with each other and communicate with each other and to do the right thing. And so, you know, sometimes you'd have to separate them, let them calm down and breathe, you know, so that we can address the issue afterwards. It's never good to try to teach a lesson in the middle of the conflict. You know, they're not going to be receptive to it. I'm not. When I'm really upset about something, like that's the last time, that's the least moment that I want to be taught a lesson. Right. And so I say, just separate them, let everybody calm down and just let them know. We'll talk about this in a few minutes when we're calm, you know, and then allow them to, um, be each share, you know, what the struggle is in a calm way when you come back together again and ask questions and show empathy. Um, But I ask them a lot of questions and I I lay it out in triggers, like how to do that, like kind of step by step in some examples of what that might look like. But um, I let them talk it out. And, and then we just say, do you see how that made your brother feel? Do you understand why he wanted that or what this conflict was about? Yes or no. Or, and then you just, you know, rely on God to also give you the discernment and the wisdom to know what to say in those moments because he will. But at the end of the day, even when we, you know, recognize that we've both done things or said things that are wrong, I talk about forgiveness too. It's an opportunity to say, you know what, they didn't do the right thing. And so and so, maybe you didn't do the right thing, but we can forgive each other. And that's part of being a peacemaker too. And what does that look like? And, and you can, talk through those points with your children so that, you know, sibling rivalry, I wish I could say, oh, just say and do this and it's gone. But the fact of the matter is that's not it. It, it is a process. Um, and that's why I say take one thing and really work on that in your home and lay the foundation biblically. Take a verse on peacemaking or that passage in Romans and start talking it through with your kids and, and helping them learn to communicate differently than they are. Instead of getting angry with each other and fighting with each other, teach them to communicate. And that could look different for every family. You know, you may want to say, when someone takes something from you, what can you say or do? So that instead of hitting them or getting angry, what could be something that as a family, this is what we say so that we're communicating better. So those are just some really practical, simple things, but that they're founded in this idea of coaching and working through these issues gently and biblically, as opposed to living in constant chaos and conflict. Yeah. And another thing we always do is not to throw name calling in there. (laughs) Say, you know, say maybe your sister took the last piece of cake and they might say, you're so selfish. Well, instead of saying that, why don't you say, um, I wish you would have thought to share it with me or, you know, I wish you would have shared it with me instead of calling someone a name. And, and we go on and on. I mean, all these things. But I love how you go back to scripture and you're taking them back. And this is what God's word said. And, you know, we were talking about the tongue recently and I t- took them, them back to James 2, which talks about the tongue and, you know, the small I know the tongue is like the rudder that guides the ship and it's like the spark that starts the forest ablaze. And as I'm reading it, they're like, that's in the Bible. You know? And, you know, my girls were raised most of the time in our home. So there's not a lot of that foundation, but it's like, yes, this is what God's word said. It's all here for us. We just have to take time. We have to teach it. We have to explain what it means to our lives 
um, and do it over and over again, just like with any other training. Just teach them over and over again through practice and um, and then also prayerfully be examples. <laughs> and when we mess up, to go to them for forgiveness. Yeah, and I, I know we're running out of time, but I hope that listeners are also learning that you know sometimes we feel inadequate to help our kids or even we don't feel like we know a lot about the Bible or how to apply that to our parenting. And I hope that they're learning that we don't need to um, be afraid of that or feel inadequate because, like I said, if we just look at one issue, we 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 can Google a verse on that topic, whether it's um, peacemaking or using words that are blessings instead of curses with our kids. You know, whatever it may be, we can find verses easily and just really look into that and start talking it through um, just organically in the car when you strap in in the car to go to school or go run errands, just say, Hey, you guys, let's, let's talk about what it means to be a peacemaker again. Does anybody have any ideas about that? You know, and it's just organic. That's how we are godly parents. It's those simple moments in everyday life. They make such a big difference with our kids. And that's really laying the foundation for them that is going to last throughout their entire lives. And it doesn't have to seem scary or like we can't do it because we can, we just need to Um, be intentional and look for those opportunities where we can start promoting um, the kind of environment we want to see in our homes and the kind of behavior we want to see with our kids. And that does a lot to remove those angry reactions from the lives of our kids and from ourselves as parents. I love that. I love how you mentioned that this is something we're training them for a lifetime. It's not just we want peace in the moment. We want the conflict to stop now. But it really is our opportunity because someday they're going to be parents and they're going to be training their kids. And I see that. I mean, I have grandkids now. So, you know, it does go on. What we train and what we teach will go on to the next generation. So it's even so much more important. So, Amber, I just thank you for being here. For those who want more information about your book, Triggers, and um, parenting scripts and all the other stuff that you're working on, where can they find more information? Well, we'd love for people to join us in our Facebook group, Gentle Parenting with Amber and Wendy. If you're looking for just kind of an overall approach to gentle parenting, we talk about a lot of different topics in there. You can find me on my website as well as on um, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Pinterest as Amber Leah or Mother of Nights. I have four boys. They're my four little K-N-I-G-H-T-S's. So yeah, you can find me there. And then I also have a website with my co-author Wendy called amberandwendy.com. And we offer some really nice 10 minute teaching videos there, series that go along with our books for small groups and church use, um, as well as some other um just resources there that can be helpful for parents who are looking um, to get rid of their own anger and frustration in parenting and practical things they can say and do to breathe life into their own kids. I love that. Well, Amber, thank you so much um, for being here. And I know you're a big blessing to our audience today. Well, you bless me all the time, Trisha. Thank you for taking the time to do this um, series and to write Calming Angry Kids and to continue to help people. I know you've been a, a huge influence and blessing in my own life. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Friends, what did you think? I am always so encouraged when I talk to Amber and just how she shares from the real and hard stuff in her life and how she gives hopes to parents. And I know that like I mentioned before in the intro, change can happen. With God, we can change our, from our angry responses to gentle, kind, biblical responses. And also, I've seen change happen in kids. And I've seen angry kids turn into kids that sometimes have an episode of anger, but are no longer considered angry kids. And if you um, want hope for yourself or for your children, I encourage you to check out Calming Angry Kids, which is the book that I wrote that... Um, We'll just bring so much encouragement to you, but also Amber's books, Triggers and Parenting Scripts. Both of them give wonderful advice, and she wrote both of them with her um, co-author, Wendy Speak, but you'll get such wonderful advice on how to respond in biblical ways when you're dealing with anger. Now, the Walk It Out verse of today is Philippians 4, 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. 
And I think the second part, the Lord is near, makes the first part possible. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And so many times when I'm not feeling gentle, I'm not feeling patient, I just have to remember that the Lord is near and I only have to count on him. And I can turn to him and I can ask him for strength, even those those frustrated prayers of, Lord, I need you right now. He is there and he wants to be there for us. His spirit inside us wants to transform us so we can turn from being angry to gentle. So let me just say a prayer for you. Um, Dear God, first, I just thank you so much for Amber. I thank you for all that she was doing to teach us how to respond with gentle responses instead of anger. I thank you for what you were doing in her life and what you're continuing to do. Um, And I'm so excited that I get to be part of this project with her. And I just pray a blessing on that, Lord. But most of all, Lord, as we end this Calming Angry Kids podcast series, I pray for the parent out there that struggles with anger in their home, whether it's the parent's anger or their child's anger. I know how much that just wears on everything and it makes everything in our homes, in our lives, in our families more difficult. And I just pray a blessing, Lord. I pray that they may be encouraged to know that you can be near and you can help in the situation. Also, I pray that the listener will find and be drawn to the right the right resources that can help in the situation. I'm so thankful, Lord, that we don't have to walk this journey alone, that we can look to others who are seeking you and we could also seek you ourselves, God. And I thank you so much for that. Well, friends, I am so thankful that you're here today. Um, You are a blessing to my life. I'm so thankful that you joined me on this series that we did for Calming Angry Kids. Again, be sure to check out the book, Calming Angry Kids, at your local or online bookstore. And I pray that you will be blessed by that. As always, I want to thank my sponsor, which is David C. Cook Publishing. And David C. Cook publishes books and materials, and the proceeds from that as a nonprofit go to spread the gospel, producing more books and materials that go out to over a hundred different countries. And I just love their heart, and I love their mission, and I love all they do to spread the gospel. So thank you again, friends, for being here. If you have a chance, I would love for you to leave a review on iTunes. It just helps others to find me and also to share this episode with your friend. You just um, click on the link and share it on Facebook, share it on Instagram, send an email to someone, point them to my the page on my um website that they can click and hear more about this series on calming angry kids. It just helps me so much to know that people are benefiting from these podcasts. And I pray that you will have a blessed week. Today's podcast was edited and produced by Author Media. Opening and closing music is from the song Wide Open Space by Life Worship, used with permission from Integrity Music.